In this video, I'm going to show you how we sold over $2.8 million worth of raw land in 2022. I'm going to go over what we did well, the pros. I'm going to go over what we did wrong, the cons. And you're going to be able to take away a ton from this video in terms of either starting your land investing business or just figuring out how you can improve your current operation. I'm also going to talk about what we're doing in 2023, what we see kind of uh, coming up in the, the economy and in the land space and what we're doing to prepare for it and also some of the big changes we're making in our business. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Let's dive into it. Now, I need a preface and I'm actually going to look down at my journal here. I'm going to give you guys the total number. So we sold $2,867,522.59 worth of raw land that we acquired all direct to owner. A uh, vast majority of that came from direct mail with a slight blend on cold texting. And we'll talk about that in this video. I'm also gonna give you guys the breakdown. So a hair over 2 million came from just straight cash flips. That's where we bought it for X price, sold it for Y price at a cash price and got a big cash infusion back into our business. And then a little over $820,000 came from owner finance sales. So that's where we collect a down payment. We get monthly recurring revenue in our business. And if you guys know anything about our, our business or you followed this channel for a while, you'll know that back in the day when we started, this was our business model, right? We were the owner finance guys. We built up a really big owner finance portfolio. And as I moved into 2022, I made a conscious switch. I said, I want to play the cash game. Now you don't always get to pick and choose when you get cash buyers and when you get owner finance buyers. But what we do know is there's different subtypes. There's different genres of vacant land that you can go after that lends to a different demographic. And that demographic is typically going to be more of a cash buyer versus an owner finance buyer relative to the, the properties we were going to in the past. So that was a really big transition that we made this year. This is really what we teach within the Land Investing Accelerator program is how to buy quality properties at a discount, have built-in equity in day one and go and turn around and sell them mainly for cash flips or if we don't do that, we'll sell on owner financing and usually get 70 to 100% of our basis back in the down payment and then get the recurring revenue or we'll go and sell that note. So without further ado, let's just jump into what we did well in 2022. So the first thing that we really honed in on this year is we, we started top of funnel, right? We got to look at the land business as a funnel and the top of funnel is the market selection, the markets we decide to work in. You guys have heard me say this before, but the cost of data, the cost of mail does not change. It doesn't matter what market you're working in. You can be working in Alaska, you can be working in Texas. Those numbers are going to remain constant. The only thing that's going to differentiate our results, both in terms of uh, the yield we get from our mailers, the ROAS from our mailers, and the velocity of how quickly our deals sell is the markets we decide to work in. And when I first started in this business, like a lot of land investors, I followed outdated advice. And that advice is Go where other land investors are working, right? Go on land.com, say, oh, Joe Schmo is flipping land here. I'll just kind of ride on his coattails and go flip land in those same markets. And that works up to a certain extent, right? You can hit some base hits. You can do some okay deals. And I built my business on okay deals, right? We would just do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them a year. And this year I said, you know what? This is my competitive advantage. This is my moat. I really doubled down on the skill of selecting markets. And you guys have seen some of our previous videos. I'll link them down below, but we've got a lot of market selection videos that go over how we find markets that have real demand for vacant land and how we go and find pockets within those markets and take a sniper approach to not mailing the whole county, not even mailing necessarily a big swath of the county. In a lot of cases, we're taking really small pockets and niching down and building out our pricing around that. Now, in conjunction with that, I got really clear on my zone of genius. I got really clear on the area that I wanted to be working in. Now, this relates to locations, but really this also relates to land subtypes. You guys have heard me talk about this before. There's three main subtypes we talk about in this program, infill, rural, infill, and you know, rural recreational, which is kind of the bread and butter, classic land flipping, you know, five to 40, 60, 80 acres, rural property. And that had been my zone of genius. That had been the, the, the land that I'd love to look at, think about, buy. Like I would obsess over the rural recreational properties. And yet in previous years, I would still spend time buying infill lots or rural infill lots or just taking anything that came across my desk. And in 2022, I made a really conscious effort to say, I'm only going to go after properties that fit kind of that property avatar. I like the five to 40 acres. I like that classic pastoral rolling land with a few trees, that the iconic piece of vacant land. That was my bread and butter. And I said, anything that comes across my desk that's infill or rural infill, I'm going to look at it with a level of scrutiny. And in most cases, I'm going to turn it away. And on top of that, for my market selection, I am not going to be going after those properties because in the past, 
I would dip my toe over here. I would try a little bit of this. I'd try a little bit of that. 2022 was my year of getting really streamlined and really clear on what I was good at and what I didn't want to do. Now, you guys may not know this, but in Q1 of 2022, I had a really tough start to the year. I had changes going on in my life. I had a, a really, honestly, gut-wrenching breakup from a long-term partner. Um, I had a, a terrible start to the year in terms of sending out a bunch of campaigns. I sent out a little over 10,000 letters in December and a lot of them just didn't convert. They didn't do very well. My first time using range offers and I just came in on a slump. I also had a portfolio of properties that I bought that ended up having a little over $24,000 in water liens on them that I didn't catch on the front end. And I just feel like I was getting hit from left and from right and I made the, the mistake that I tell you guys often not to do which is I throttled back my marketing based on how I felt based on my emotional state and so we actually did not get as much mail as we wanted out most of our mailing really started to ramp up in Q2 so 124,000 is in the grand scheme of things not a lot but when we look at what we did in 2021 it was almost doubling our output and so it's pretty obvious that yes doubling our output didn't necessarily double our volume because we went after a higher caliber a higher quality deal that requires more letters per deal to get done. Back in the day, we would send 600 letters, 700 letters and get a deal. Now in our business, somewhere between 2,000 to 2,500, just depending on the market. And so we didn't do as much volume as we did in the years previous, but our revenue shot way through the roof. We doubled our revenue, actually more than doubled our revenue from 2021 to 2022. Now, the next thing that I did is I refined my acquisition process. And for years, I had this, this horrible uh, misaligned belief that and it, 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 it'll make sense when I explain it here, but I had this belief that the real value in this business was dispositions. And for what I had been doing in years past, this was true, right? For these smaller, cheap entry level properties, the acquisition process is very straightforward. Most gurus will teach you how to go buy a desert square and they teach that because it's very easy to acquire and you'll get a small win immediately. And that builds goodwill for their students and people get excited. So they have you go after these crappy properties. There's the, the kind of hidden dark side of it though is the dispo process is very difficult. You're buying a piece of land that has low intrinsic value. Very few people are actually gonna fully recognize and develop that property and do something with it because there's just not much to it. And it'd be extremely difficult to turn that into anything meaningful. And so the dispo process for those cheaper and more insignificant properties is actually the lion's share of the work. And I had been in that space for years. And so my belief coming into 2022 is I needed to bolster my dispo dispo team. And so I allocated resources and time to building out my dispo team. And I built a kick butt dispositions team. And we still have a really good dispositions team, but I neglected a lot of my acquisitions team in terms of building it out and building a comprehensive system and really thinking about how to structure that. And it wasn't until about Q2 of 2022 that I said, something's off here, right? We're dumping so much into marketing. And then we have this very rudimentary basic acquisition process that was not fully extracting the value from our marketing dollars. You've heard me talk about this before, but we shoot for a 10X ROAS which is return on ad spend. And I was not quite hitting that. And it's because I wasn't fully nurturing those leads and taking them through the seller's journey. Every single lead that comes into your system is at a slightly different part in their journey. And for us, if the person wasn't ready to sell immediately, we had no way to sequence them and kind of ascend them through the, the journey of doing a deal with us. And so we started to really double down on that. I built out a more comprehensive team in terms of having an acquisition manager with a lead qualifier or an intake manager, whatever you want to call them sitting underneath them. Someone to prep and review the leads and get them in a state that's ready to pass off to the acquisition manager. And then that leads us into the next point, which is we brought cold texting into our business. One of the things that we did is from the jump, I built out a cold texting team to run that. And that's kind of part of our acquisition team that's nested under that same department. And this was a really big deal for us in our business. Now, you guys have heard me talk about it before. Texting is not everything it's cracked up to be. It's a great channel. It's not the end all be all. It's not the cheapest channel out there. Just in our business, we spend about five grand a month on payroll just to, to have a team that sits there and manages all those leads. There's a lot of qualifying that needs to be done because you get a lot of leads that frankly aren't qualified or just aren't ready because they're very, very early in the seller's journey. And so bringing texting into our business was a huge bump up in terms of getting immediate response from new markets that we were testing before dumping a, a big batch of mailers. It's a really good way for us to test pricing. It's a really good way for us to test markets. It was also a way for us to reach a different cohort, right? What I found is that if I mail a list and I text a list, I'm talking to two different audiences, even if it's the same list. And so we were able to extract more value out of the data that we were already pre-purchasing for mailing and reach a totally different segment of that list. And so this added a few hundred thousand dollars in profit to our business just from 
texting this year alone. And that kind of falls in conjunction with bolstering our acquisitions team, getting the right people in the right seats, and also being systematic with how I built that approach, right? Previously, it was the lay down deals would come in, we would take those, anything that needed additional work, there was no infrastructure or no system to handle the leads that weren't quite ready yet. Hey, fellow land investor, we're gonna do a quick commercial break here, and that is for our land investing accelerator program. Look, if you are looking to scale and grow a six and seven figure business and go and join dozens of other land investors, you're gonna to wanna to check out the Land Investing Accelerator program. In fact, you can actually book a one hour strategy call with yours truly to learn all the ins and outs of running a land investing business totally for free. And through that process, we'll identify if joining the Land Investing Accelerator program is a good fit for you. This is our group coaching model. This is how we've turned beginners to seven figure land flippers in just under a few years. We've got dozens of incredible members in there. So if you're looking to grow your land business in 2023, this is the place to be. You guys can book a call with yours truly down below, or you can head over to landinvestor.com to learn more about the Leo program. All right, sorry guys, I had to pop off the jacket. It is hot in here. All this talk about land is getting me excited. The next thing that we did in our business is we doubled down on the markets that were working for us. This is something that we teach heavily in the Leo program. What I see far too many land investors doing and what I was stuck on for years is what I call the hamster wheel of always trying to find new markets, right? You hit a market, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't work out. But the next logical thought for most land investors is gotta go find another market. You're always on this hamster wheel of finding new markets. And yes, yeah, sometimes you hit gold, you find a honey hole. But the truth of the matter is more times than not, you are kind of sending out mail on a hope and a prayer. And that is not a strategy to run a business where, there's, where you need consistency, right? If I need predictability and I need to be able to forecast my results, I can't always be playing this game of throwing darts at the board. And so what I said is, let me reframe this, right? Let me take the markets that I already have a proof of concept on and markets where I've already sold deals. If you sold a deal on a market, you have the most valuable piece of data that very few other land investors have. And that's going to far and exceed any information you could ever find online on any public listing website. And so we started taking the, the markets where we were doing deals, the markets where I had positive feedback, where I had positive yield, I had a really strong ROAS from our marketing campaigns and started doubling down on our marketing efforts there. Not only did this reduce the time that we were spending on constantly selecting new markets, this also gave us a layer of predictability and that allowed us to forecast our results. Now, I can make a whole separate video on this, but just to sum it up, we would typically would be remailing these markets on a quarterly basis to keep on showing up. And this was a huge, huge breakthrough for us in our business. Now, the next thing that we did in our business is we halted all small deal acquisitions. Now, I would be lying if I said I still didn't buy a few small deals here and there. I'm a small deal addict, I'm a recovering small deal addict. And so we would still get inbound leads that would come to us and I did snag a, a few dozen of them. We also have a big owner finance portfolio mainly made up of small deals and some of those would default and we'd go and re, you know, resell them. So we still had some of them in our portfolio, some that were being resold and that definitely brought our average gross profit per deal down a bit. But about the midpoint of the year, I halted all acquisitions on smaller deals. And what I've learned is the opportunity cost there is actually a lot bigger than any of us realize. Every single deal Deal you push through your business, whether you have a team or not, it adds friction to your business. And there's a layer of additional complexity and work that's added to the process internally, right? And so every single deal that we push through, there's a real opportunity cost in terms of another deal that we might not have the bandwidth to do. It's not like you can just throw an unlimited number of deals at your business and it can just gobble them all up. And we really kind of stretch the bounds and the possibilities of pushing as many acquisitions through our business as possible. And what I found is these small deals made up such a small fraction of our profit and still took up an equal amount of time to a larger deal. And so at the midpoint of the year, I, I got really firm on saying, you know what, we're not sending out any new marketing to smaller acquisitions. If we have portfolio deals that come to us, we'll still opt to buy those, but small one-off deals is just something that we were not doing any longer. And that also uh, kind of rolls over into no more self-closings. Now, I really put the halt on self-closings at the end of 2021. It was such a burden on myself and on my team. And there's a layer of risk to that as well that just really, it, it didn't allow me to sleep easy at night. And so we still had a few that cropped up throughout the year, but in the midpoint of 2022, I just drew a line in the sand and said, no more small deals, no more self-closing.